Dog Sports Radio. Here's your host, Christopher Mad Dog Russo. All right, here we go now. We start off hour two. He's done an absolutely superb job for us. We've appreciated it. Uh, here, give us a few minutes here today. He's busy. He's got TV in a little bit, but he's going to squeeze us in. Give us a thought. Mr. Lapis. Steve, of course, uh, Villanova. CBS has done a wonderful job. Steve, good to talk. Nice to have you with us here today. Um, you've been around a long time. Uh, you're going to have to go a long way to find a better game than we saw Saturday night, Steve. And the thing I like about the game more than anything else, people made plays. UCLA shot 58%. Gonzaga shot 57%. 20, com- 20 combined turnovers, a 10 apiece. That's phenomenal in an overtime game. And if I'm Mick Cronin there, Steve, I got to tip my cap. I can't get upset. I mean, I almost leave the court with my head held high with the quality of the game and the fact Gonzaga made lots of plays. Let's discuss all that first. Go ahead. Let me hear. Well, you know, you know what, dog? For 45 minutes, that game was as good as it gets. And obviously the ending made it extra special also. We also had a pretty good ending, not as good a game, in 2016, when Marcus Page made that double clutch in front of Roy Williams and then Villanova comes down and wins the game at the buzzer. Now, that game was, you know what I mean? So, so that also was a really, really good ending. But this game, as you said, the way it was played, both teams shooting such a high percentage. And, and I didn't realize this. This is a crazy statistic, dog. It was the first time that both teams shot over 50% in a Final Four since 1985, our game was wow. short now. I found wow. that so hard to believe, and I made our, our stats people check it twice and three times, and that is a fact. So it's rare that we see two teams play that good in a Final Four. So we saw something special. Uh, are you shocked that UCLA was able to take them to the limit? Uh, I was shocked in the way it happened. You know, I'd be honest with you, I thought it was going to be a close game, mainly because – you know, UCLA is a team that played a slow tempo. The teams that play slow against Gonzaga but regularly play slow have a better chance. You can't be a fast-playing team that is, oh, no, tomorrow we got to play slow. No, no, that doesn't work. But I thought UCLA, because they played a slow tempo all year, that they'd have a chance to hang in there. And you know what the crazy thing was? It was 93-90, but it wasn't a real fast tempo. It was just one team shot 59 and one team shot 58, as you said. So – the scoring was just unbelievable in the half court. But you're right. The other thing is I, I loved about Mick what he said at the end of the game. He said, I sit in John Wooden's chair. John Wooden said that all you can ask for to be successful is that you gave your best effort. And, boy, they have nothing to hang their heads about. They gave their best effort, according to John Wooden. He had everything to be proud of. All right, two quickies before we move on. Number one, did Cronin make a mistake in the last 3.3 seconds letting Suggs? You know, listen, it's a 38-footer, so I'm not going to sit there and tell you it was was a very difficult shot. But in three seconds, they got the ball to him in that spot, and it it was a pretty good look considering the time. Did UCLA defensively make a mistake? Yeah, you know what what happened, I think, in that situation too, dog, is that, you know, the UCLA kid just scored. I think everybody in the building thinks, okay, we're going overtime. So that they tended to stop playing. And I don't think, obviously, if they made uh, Jalen Suggs spin or turn one time, he would have got, he would have shot it from half court as opposed to 35 feet, 36 feet. So, you know, that being said, I think the, the UCLA kids understandably didn't really do the right thing in that situation in terms of react, get on Suggs, Make him at least delay by a second. One second would have changed what kind of shot he was going to get. But you, you can't fault him almost. It's just something that happens. Bang, bang. And he banked it in. Phenomenal. All right. Uh, did I don't know if he had a timeout left. He probably didn't. Should UCLA, if, if they did, should UCLA have called the timeout in their last possession of regulation, Steve? See, I don't like calling a timeout in that situation. Um, me personally, I think, I think what you're doing in that situation is you're giving the defense a chance to get set. And I always feel like in that kind of spot, everybody gets a little antsy. You don't want the coach to be able to tell the guys, now listen, let's get settled, let's get set, here's what we got to try. I would rather just go in that situation. So, I mean, well, think about Mark Few. He had a timeout left. And he let Suggs just go the length of the court and try and score instead of call. A lot of coaches would have called timeout as soon as Juzang made that shot. But Mark, you had a timeout left and didn't call timeout. 
and the kid makes the shot. So I don't like calling timeout in that situation. Now, if there's like 12 seconds left and your guy brings the ball up and nothing's happening and now we're down to three, yeah, then maybe I would call timeout. But in that situation, bang, bang, a couple of seconds to go, I would just let it go. I'm not sure if he had one, but that's a good piece of information. And let's give the officials credit, Steve. Sometimes officials can screw up great games. They did not. They did a call to great game. And that official who called that block uh, on offensive foul call, which it was on Jazang running into Timmy with three sec with point seven seconds to go in overtime. That is a gutty, correct call that I've seen many officials screw that up. That is a super call under the circumstances. So let's give the three officials credit in this game. Let me get your take on that. Go ahead. I thought, yeah, I agree with you totally. I think the officials did a great job. That's a bang bang play, as you said, and they got it 100 percent right. You know, the other thing they got right on the subs block was that a lot of people were complaining about was that, as you notice, after he blocks it, he runs out of bounds, and then he comes back in and gets the ball and goes and runs a fast break where Kispert gets the dunk in transition. A lot of people were saying, "Well, you can't go out of bounds to inbound," but the, the truth is. The rule says that if you go out of bounds because your momentum took you out of bounds, you weren't trying to be out of bounds, and then you get one foot back in, you could get the ball. And that why that was also a tremendous wow. call by the official. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I didn't realize that, that people have been making – I didn't even think of that, that people were yeah. making an issue of that in Indianapolis. So I'm learning something. Well done there, Steve. And that is – talk about that athletic play. Boy, oh, boy, blocks the shot. Uh, on a tremendous play. I was thinking there might have been a foul there. There was no foul on the replay. Blocks the shot, gets the rebound. I thought it was Timmy. It was uh, Kispert who gets the dunk on the other end off a yes. great pass. I mean, that is an unbelievable play by Suggs late in that game. Let's discuss that for a sec. Go ahead. That that kid, uh, listen, he's a, he's a lottery pick. There's a reason why he's a lottery pick. He is a, a tremendous athlete, Um and, I mean, the way that play went, to block that shot that looked like it was going to be an easy dunk, no problem, by a 6'4 guard, and then for him to, like, dance, get back in bounds, get the ball, and then throw a bounce pass, like, 25 feet to a guy coming in for a dunk, it was just, I mean, that was such a bang, bang play in every regard. He is a big, big-time player, there's no doubt. He sure is, no question. You know, the other thing I like about the game, too, Steve, in this game, uh, UCLA trailed in overtime by five, got the game tied, and the losing team had a chance to win it at the end of regulation. Now, when you're the losing team, it's like in tennis when both players have a match point and the only one guy loses. When the losing, because that's a classic match, when, like Federer and uh, Djokovic and that Wimbledon final a couple of years ago, I don't know if you care about tennis, but five hours – the Fed's yep. got a match point, doesn't get it, and Djokovic wins the match. UCLA theoretically had a match point at the end of regulation and still lost. When that kind of thing happens in sports, that to me is the definition of classic. Let me hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, they, as you said, they had the chance to win. They had the ball last. They weren't able to score. And, uh, and, and they hung in there unbelievably in, in overtime. Uh, like we said, to go down early. I mean, Timmy just dominated the overtime. So yeah, that was a that was a classic game in in every sense of the word. Like you said, I mean, played 45 minutes, 10 turnovers, two teams shooting the high 50s percentage wise. That was as good a played game as you could possibly get. Is that one of the? Now you've been around a long time, and you've been on that sideline when Roley, when the Villanova and Roley won that title. Different kind of game than this game. Is this one of the great college games you've ever seen? Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, I put it this way. People are talking about this one and the, you know, the Christian Leitner game, as we call it, in 1992 between uh, uh, in Kentucky and Duke in Philadelphia. So, I mean, you know, when we talk about the greatest games ever, you know, and they, every few years or so, you know, somebody comes up with a production of, let's do the, you know, 10 greatest games ever. I got a feeling this one's going to be in there for sure. And I think they won. And I, yes, uh, don't forget that Carolina at NC State game against Maryland in the ACC tournament final in yeah. '74. Don't forget that That's game. That's another so, one that comes up. Yes, it comes up. Now, the one thing I would say about the Sug shot, and I think there's something to it. We discussed it in our first hour today with the fans. The game was tied. When you make that shot, 
when the game is tied, it's different than Leitner, who makes a shot when you trail. What's your take on that? Totally agree. I mean, you put it this way. You know, Suggs, they had nothing to lose there. At the worst, they were going overtime. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, think about how Mark you felt when Johnny Juzang got the ball and they're down two and he's bringing the ball. I swear to God, I thought he was going to pull it up from three. Because the way he'd been on fire, I thought he was going to take a three there. Now, if he pulls up from three, Mark Hughes got his heart in his mouth because he could lose the game there. So, yes, it definitely takes on a whole new meaning when, put it this way, if they were down two and Suggs does that, then it adds to the folklore of, the, of this game in terms of what people will be saying years from now. It's nonetheless, it was a big-time shot, no doubt, but if they were down, it would have been even bigger. We never Jenkins made the shot for Villanova against Carolina. The game was tied. It does change it to a degree. Yeah. All right, now, um, you can go one of two ways with this game. Um, uh, you know, Gonzaga, a lot of energy, uh, overtime, late at night. I know Calhoun used to tell me all the time when he won his first championship that he thought that Duke had to get by Michigan State in 99 in that rugged game at night late. He thought that was an advantage for UConn on Monday night. A little momentum, Duke a little tired. Uh, now, you could go the other way with Gonzaga and say they have a lot of momentum. They got through their one tough game, their cruise tonight. Which way you go as far as the after effects of this performance? Which way do you go as far as their level tonight against Baylor? Let me hear. I'm, co- I'm concerned for Gonzaga, without a doubt, because not only did you have this 45-minute overtime classic that, was en- that ended very emotionally, late at night, midnight, and those kids, you're, you're so wired. Who knows if anybody fell asleep before 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning? So, you know, forget about the fact the game ended at midnight. They probably didn't get any kind of semblance of sleep till 5 o'clock because they were, they were on a high. They had to be. I mean, you're, you're human. And, so, and, and they don't play a lot of bench. They only play two guys off the bench, and they don't play all that much. So those five guys had to be a little spent. So, yes, I am concerned about them. Late at night, Saturday night, coming back on Monday, and you couple that with the fact that Baylor had an easy game. I mean, Baylor's game at halftime was over. They were up 25 points at halftime. The game was over. So in the second half, they were on a little bit of cruise control. There's no doubt about it. It's just like naturally to happen. So, uh, so Baylor's had this trajectory of up, 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 and Gonzaga's had this trajectory of up, up, but whoa, look what happened here, and now they got to get up again. I am definitely concerned. Interesting. Now, because of that, let's turn our attention with Steve Lapis to the game tonight. If I'm Drew, I'm pushing that tempo early in the game with those guards. I'm going to test their stamina. I'm going to test their what's in their legs early in this game. I'm going to push it. I'm going to see what they have after this 93-90 win. Um, is that a bad suggestion or a good suggestion? No, no, it, it's a good suggestion, but I think the, the, the problem for Gonzaga, if there's going to be one, is going to show later in the game. And uh, I think what, what Scott Drew's going to do is, because they're good at this, and this is, they have guys that can do it, I think he's going to pressure Gonzaga hard. I think he's going to pressure those guards. I think he's going to make them have to make decisions with the ball. To me, that's how you wear a team out, you know, more than anything else. And they're good at it. It's not like it's something that they have to, that they would just be doing and saying, hey, let's pressure them because they might be tired. No, no. This is what they do. I think they're going to bring another level of pressure pressure at Gonzaga tonight from the beginning of this game and really get into those guards hard. That's what I think. All right. So you think Baylor actually gets a break that Gonzaga had to go to the wall to get out of the semifinal, to make a long story short? Yeah, I think they I think they get a break now. Like I said, hey, it's not going to be easy. The Gonzaga team is tremendous, as we know. But I think that Baylor, I put it this way: if you ask me, if you tell me here's what's going to happen on Saturday. Which team would you rather be? I say I'd rather be Baylor. Interesting. Now, uh, I don't know if Baylor, if all things are equal, the problem that Baylor is going to have in this game, if all things were equal. I mean, they got Timmy, and Baylor doesn't. I mean, that's essentially what it comes down to. I mean, Baylor's offense in the low bar, forget Kispert. He can be hit, hit or miss with his threes. But the, the, uh, Timmy in the low box is a major advantage. And Baylor doesn't have a guy who can score down low 
and Gonzaga does. And a, a not, not just an average player, a hell of a player. I think that's the big advantage of all, thing is e- of all things being equal that the Zags have in this game. You agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, he's the difference. I mean, you, 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 have, you have four tremendous perimeter guys that all can pass, dribble, and shoot. And then you got a guy in the lane that shoots 65%, doesn't miss. And the thing about him that makes him even tougher, as opposed to the kid at Michigan, who's a good player, Hunter Dickinson. But with Hunter Dickinson, if you took away his right shoulder, he had trouble going the other way. This guy goes both ways. He's, good with the, he's as good with the left as he is with the right. Now you've got a real problem. You've got to keep the ball out of his hands somehow. What I think Baylor's going to do, they, they, and they have a kid like Chambo Chachua, who's a really good defender. He's 6'9". They've got to work really hard at fronting Timmy and not letting him get the ball and putting pressure on the guards to make those entry passes to Timmy much more difficult. That's the only chance you have because you can't double him. He's averaging four assists a game. So you double him, he's going to bury you by kicking the ball out of the post. If you play him one-on-one, once he catches it, he's going to score. You've got to try your best, and it's easier said than done. There's no doubt. You have to try to keep the ball out of his hands. I even said this on the air yesterday that the biggest, what, what Scott Drew and his staff spent the most time talking about was how they were going to guard Drew Timmy in this game. Wow, fascinating. Uh, Seven-game series, how many would Baylor win? Two or one? Two. I think, I think Baylor would win two. I think Gonzaga is better. There's no question. Uh, and I, I worry, like I said, about the emotional and the physical aspect of what happened on Saturday. I think Baylor is – those three guards are really terrific. I'll tell you that. And uh, I think they could win two. But I think of, overall in a seven-game series, there's no doubt Gonzaga is better. All right, last thing. When you got ready with Villanova to beat Georgetown, we all knew how great Georgetown was, but you had played them a lot. But you've told me in the past, both on and off the air, that Roley and you were confident that you could win that game. Let me t- let's talk about that for a sec. Go ahead. I mean, we played them two games that year that were basically one possession games. And the year before, I got there that year, but the year before, before I got to Villanova, they had beaten them. So Eddie Pickney and those guys had beaten Patrick Ewing before. It wasn't not a lot, but they had beaten them. So there's no doubt that that was, and I know they call it the greatest upset of all time. We didn't think so, i got to be honest with you, because when you play in the same league, it's just different. Eddie Pickney played against Patrick eight or nine times in his career before that game. He wasn't, Eddie Pickney had a 22-point, 22-rebound game against Georgetown when he was a sophomore. There was no fear factor. So when there's no fear factor, it's a huge difference. Now, granted, with all that, we shot 79%. We won by two. So, I mean, that tells you something right there, how good they were. There's no uh, doubt. Now, we now, we Banner, now, Banner doesn't have that advantage tonight, but I don't think they're a fearful team. What's your thoughts there? No, when you play in the Big 12, you can't be afraid. I mean, you think about the teams that these guys play every day. You're talking about playing Kansas, playing Texas, playing Texas Tech, playing, you know, Oklahoma. They play good teams every game in that Big 12. Even with TCU and the teams that were at the bottom of the league this year, except for Iowa State, every game was tough. So, no, they definitely are not going to be afraid. There will be no off factor. It was different. You know, Patrick Ewing was the kind of guy, he, he inspired awe in his opponents because he was so physically gifted. He could block every shot like he did in those days. This is a little different. No, Baylor definitely not intimidating. All right, two quickies on the coaches. Hubert Davis at North Carolina. Shocked that Parker Mosier might go to Oklahoma. Let me hear your thoughts. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised about uh, either one of those. I, th- I thought initially, as soon as I heard Roy was retiring, my first thought was Hubert Davis. I think that, that I always felt like that's one of the reasons why he went back there. He's such a good guy. And uh, obviously he's going, to the, he's going into a – you know how they, you know, they, you know, they say as an assistant, you're only moving over like 18 inches? Well, let me tell you something. That's a huge move going to assistant – from assistant North Carolina to the head basketball coach of North Carolina comes with tremendous pressure, no doubt about it. But I love Hubert Davis. He's a great guy. Do I know he can coach? No, he doesn't even know if he can coach. You don't know if he's coach. And so, you know, being an assistant is way different than doing what he's going to do. But I like the pick because it's North Carolina. You had to keep it in the family. I thought it was either going to be him or Wes Miller. I know they got some other guys out there who are coaching in Division One, but haven't been as successful. I- I'm not surprised that they went to Hubert Davis. 
All right, West Miller, is that the kid at Greensboro? Is that who West Miller is? Yeah, UNC okay. Greensboro, yes. I was shocked that Mosier is going to Oklahoma. Uh, is Oklahoma a great job that Mosier is going to leave that place in Chicago to go there? Let me get your thoughts. Go ahead. Well, you, you think about it. I mean, Lon Kruger won there. Kelvin Sampson won there. You know, I know a lot of people say, well, Oklahoma is not – it it's, it's certainly not the best basketball job in that league. But, I mean, look at what, look at what Chris Beard did at Texas Tech, which was probably – the worst basketball job in that league. And now they've become a, obviously he's gone now, but so I think Porter Moser is a tremendous coach. I don't doubt the fact, and he's got a great style defensively. They're going to be one of the top teams. The question I have is, is that style? Cause he likes to play slow. He likes playing those 58, 56 games. You know, is that going to, how is that going to be uh, in, in, uh, in Norman, Oklahoma? We'll see. But I think as long as you win enough, everything's fine. Good job, Steve. Well done. You did a wonderful job for us this month. You know how much we appreciate it, and you are very good on TV. Have a good show tonight. Thanks very much. Yeah, appreciate it today. Chris, thanks for having me, man. It's always fun with you. Thank you. Okay, Steve Lapis, thoughts? 